So before we get into today's episode, I just want to let you know that my candle shop, Knox and Vesta, has finally opened and is available to sell candles. I have been working on this project for way too long, way longer than I would like to admit, but the point is it is finally here, better late than never. I've got these big, beautiful candles that don't have any paraffin in them. They burn like 65 to 70 hours, and I've got some really great scents. Everything from Alexandria, which smells like the library, to Tempest, which smells like rain. So make sure to check it out by going to Knox Vesta.com or checking out its Instagram, also Knox Vesta. That's spelled N O X V E S T A. We know Alex Jones thinks frogs can become gay from contaminated water, but why? I think that's one of the questions I see most asked when it comes to conspiracy theorists like him. How does someone fall this deep down a rabbit hole without realizing it? Is there a reason Alex Jones is this way? And how bad does it get? From suing parents of shooting victims to his questionable origin story, today we'll explore who Alex Jones is and how he became so infamous. So hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Corporate Casket. Now, to be clear, I can't address every single thing that Alex Jones has ever said or did or whatever, because we will be here forever. But just like with OAN, we're going to talk about some of the major massive scandals that define Alex Jones as a person. Also as a content warning, we will be talking about violence and school shootings and some of the darker aspects to InfoWars stories. So if that upsets you, please feel free to click away. But with that out of the way, let's get into it. Alex Jones's origin story goes a little something like this. When he was 16 years old, cops would sell him and other classmates bags of drugs. One day at school, when there was a meeting in the auditorium about drug testing, several of these cops were on the stage. Alex Jones stood up and said, I was at a pool party. He was selling cocaine and ecstasy last week, calling these cops out for corruption. Apparently, these police officers took Alex into another room, rammed his head against a wall, and told him they'd kill him if he didn't shut up. A short while later, he and his family moved to Austin, Texas because of it. That's the story of Alex Jones in a tiny little nutshell, at least according to him and what he's told people in interviews. And to some extent, I guess it makes sense. No wonder he's such a conspiracy theorist if he witnessed corruption firsthand at such a young age, right? But here's the thing. I just so happened to catch a radio program all about Alex Jones a few months ago from This American Life. And it was episode 670 called Beware the Jabberwock. During that episode, a man named John Ronson is interviewed, a man who has known Alex Jones for years, long before he became infamous. According to John, that's not Alex Jones's origin story at all. And he's spoken to former InfoWars employees and people who were actually there that day to verify it. The thing is, yes, the local sheriff in Alex's hometown was convicted of stealing marijuana from the police evidence room with a plan to sell it. So Alex Jones's backstory does seem to hold some water at a glance. But once you dig a little deeper, former classmates of Alex say they don't remember an assembly like this happening at all. One such classmate, Ryan Tipton, said it was probably the D.A.R.E. program assembly and that no one, certainly not Alex Jones, stood up and said, yeah, that officer was selling cocaine last week. The police officer who actually worked in the school when Alex was there said that, quote, I would be willing to bet my whole pension that never happened. I don't think there were any times where actually we were even questioning a student that an administrator wasn't in the room, end quote. So what is Alex Jones's backstory? What makes him this way? Well, as it turns out, he apparently just beat people up and then his father, a dentist, would pay their medical bills and tell people not to sue. Alex's father allegedly even gave a book about why it's wrong to sue people to the parents of one of Alex's victims and classmates. So he wasn't particularly popular. According to This American Life, no one liked him because he was a bully. There was a group of kids that felt unsafe around him. And so they came up with a plan to trick him. They invited him out to a party in a barn. It was a trap. Josh, a former InfoWars employee said, they beat him within an inch of his life. That's why his family moved to Austin. His whole family uprooted him and moved into a completely different city because of this crazy thing that happened to him. Josh said having those guys conspire against Alex by luring him to that party was the real reason he got obsessed with conspiracies. He had been a victim of one. Even though I don't condone violence, obviously, I get why these teenagers were angry and wanted to take justice into their own hands, although it doesn't make it right what happened. Honestly, it's just fascinating to me to see how someone's mind works, why they actually act the way they do. To realize that this may have been the inciting incident that made Alex Jones the conspiracy theorist he is today is interesting to me. 
As for his early career, Alex Jones began as a local cable access cult figure on ACA TV, Austin Community Access Television in the 90s. According to one source, ACA TV in the 90s was pure Austin at its weirdest. Sure, the internet was around, but not in the way we know it today. So the local public access TV channels 10 and 16 were populated by a never ending string of shows. Eccentric, religious, bizarre, and just plain unlike anything anyone had ever seen. Basically, the whole thing was a typical Austin thing, said Carrie On, a local comedian who also had a public access show at the time called The Ronnie Velveeta Show. The ACA TV broadcasting ethos was, hey, have your own show, just come on down and do it, On explained. Such local homespun public access oddities included an accordion-wielding singing Austrian, a fundamentalist preacher who wore a toilet seat around his neck, and of course, a 22-year-old Alex Jones who ranted about black helicopters, the Illuminati, and how NASA faked the moon landing. When Oklahoma City was bombed, Jones jumped on it. He immediately began accusing the government of being involved. I understood there's a kleptocracy working with psychopathic governments, clutches of evil that know the tricks of control, he says. Jones began building up a fan base, subbing in for sick hosts and broadcasting his beliefs to fans that sent him more evidence of the new world order in the mail. Alex Jones had been this way for a while. I've heard it said that he can't actually really believe what he's saying and it's just a front or an act, an exaggerated personality, but make no mistake, Alex Jones has spoken like this for decades. A former ACA TV producer said that he was amusing at first in a tinfoil hat kind of way, but it became worrying and uncomfortable when she realized that he was the same person off camera that was in front of one. Charlie Sotelo, another former producer at ACA TV claims, Jones's whole act was, I'm burdened by how much knowledge I have and I have to share it with you guys because it's my duty. And he was burdened by his responsibility to society. I didn't approach him like, oh, he's this expert guy. I just approached him like this kid who was saying whatever he could think of. So it was painfully obvious to me the whole time, said Sotelo. He's just saying whatever is popping into his dumb slow head right now. What started off as, ha, look at this silly joke, ended up being, oh no, this guy's going to be a monster. Jones still had troubles with violence as well. He held an open house at ACA TV meant for fans, but his call-in hecklers showed up instead. The leader of these hecklers, who Sotelo describes as scrappy and scrawny, was insulting Jones in the lobby. Jones suggested they step outside. This heckler actually hit Jones eight to 10 times in the face, mocking him and getting the better of Alex during their fight. Satella told him to go outside, but once Alex was around his workers and inside the station again, he told everyone that there were four or five of them with a knife. Satello called him out on the lie and Jones spit at him, screamed, whose side are you on? And threw a punch in his direction. Jones's punch missed, but Satello in turn punched Alex in the face, having been pushed to his limit. A police report was made about this whole incident, by the way, and it is, it's something all right. Not only does he claim that there were four or five men that beat him up, but he said the ringleader had a double-edged military type killing knife and he had eyes like a goat with pasty white green skin. Once again, Alex Jones's daddy came to the rescue and paid Sotelo a hundred dollars. Perhaps it was for the shirt Alex spit blood onto, or maybe it was a thank you for not pressing charges. Either way, I find it hilariously pathetic. However, Now that we've got a good picture of who Alex Jones is and a bit about his early years, let's get into how InfoWars was established and examine just a snippet of the claims that he's made. And before we get into that, I'm gonna take a quick moment to place today's sponsors right here and no, they're not going to be male enlarging pills like what you'll find on InfoWars. So here you go. Today's episode is sponsored by Mint Mobile. And you guys already know, I love them. Hopefully you love them too. If you don't quite love them or don't really know who Mint Mobile is, let me put you onto this. Mint Mobile offers premium wireless service for your cell phone that starts at just $15 a month. And it sounds like a joke because why is it just starting at 15 bucks a month? Like we know how much the other providers cost. Well, simply put, Mint Mobile cuts out brick and mortar stores. They sell only online. So they have a bunch of savings, so they pass it on to you. I think you guys know I've been using Mint Mobile at this point for almost a year and I have not had any problems at this point. I've, after saying using it for a year, um, wow, number one, number two, wow. And number three, I feel really dumb that I didn't switch sooner. All of their plans, by the way, come with unlimited talk, text and high-speed data on the nation's largest 5G network. Plus you can keep your old phone number and your old phone so you don't have to buy anything new, change your number, anything like that if you don't want to. They're super easy to work with. So if you wanna get your new wireless plan for just 15 
bucks a month and get the plan shipped to your door for free, make sure you go to mintmobile.com slash casket. That's mintmobile.com slash casket. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash casket. This episode is also sponsored by Talkspace because mental health is often stigmatized. So a lot of things can get in the way of seeking help. You might be afraid or unable to open up to friends and family, or perhaps you don't feel comfortable with talking to a stranger IRL. I know that since the pandemic hit and I've had to go into virtual therapy and I actually used Talkspace before they reached out to me. So it was, it's kind of surreal, but I used to see an in-person therapist and then I switched to online because of the panini. And honestly, I don't want to go back. Talkspace, by the way, they make it possible to speak with a licensed therapist via text, video, or phone, whatever you're most comfortable with. It's hundred percent secure and stigma free the way therapy should be. Talkspace essentially puts you into a private virtual room with just you and your therapist and your conversation will be protected thanks to their encryption and added security. So join Talkspace today and start moving forward with a single message. Just visit Talkspace.com and get $100 off your first month when you use promo code casket at sign up. That's $100 off at Talkspace.com promo code casket. After his call-in public access program, Alex Jones moved on to the radio. In 1996, he hosted the final edition on KJFK or 98.9 FM. He gained a bit of credibility here and there, and he claimed that the Branch Davidians hadn't committed suicide in the events at Waco, but had been attacked by government agents. We've gone over the Waco siege in another episode, and once people learned how poorly authorities handled the situation, it seemed possible Alex Jones was onto something. Eventually though, Alex claims he was told by his employers to lay off politicians, to stop ranting about rebuilding the church and stop bashing Marines, you name it. The station itself claimed that they just wanted Jones to broaden his topics, and there was never any intent of censoring him. Regardless of their intent, whether they wanted him to shut up or talk about something else, it didn't work. Alex Jones was fired in 1999. At this point though, he had a website, infowars.com, and he had a fan base. And as Rolling Stone puts it, he'd already outgrown the limitations of old fashioned broadcasting. He installed an ISDN line at home that let him broadcast his program to 10 different stations across the country, supposedly more than KJFK had reaching at the time. He moved into filmmaking and in July, 2001, started claiming that the government was planning acts of terrorism. When 9-11 happened, once again, this seemed to lend Alex Jones some credibility. His cult profile rose and other conspiracy-minded people were drawn to him. And here's the thing, and I'm going to insert my opinion here for just a moment, and you can feel free to take it or leave it. But in my opinion, when someone runs around constantly screaming that everything is a government conspiracy, they're going to be right on occasion by sheer chance. I've talked about horrific things the government has taken part of on this channel before, Hell, as I even said a moment ago, I have an entire episode on the Waco siege. When Alex Jones has been right about something happening, whether that's the mishandling of the Waco siege or an act of terrorism taking place, even though he has no proof that the government had any part in 9-11. We've got all this like evidence. It's dumb luck that he's correct. It's that saying that the whole, even a broken clock is right twice a day thing. That's what's going on here in my opinion. He's thrown so much crap at the wall that yeah, a very small amount of it will unfortunately stick. And as luck will have it, conspiracy theorists have used these very isolated instances to legitimize him, hence his growing platform. Anyway, once 2001 rolled around, Jones's show was syndicated on about a hundred stations. Once he started preaching about 9-11 being an inside job, he lost more than 70 of them. His loyal fans though, only seem to dig their heels in deeper. For example, four days after 9-11, a Syrian newspaper said that 4,000 Jews were absent from work the day the towers fell. Yet the actual source of that 4,000 number was from the Jerusalem Post, which read, quote, "'The foreign ministry in Jerusalem has so far received the names of 4,000 Israelis believed to have been in the areas of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon at the time of the attacks,' end quote." The former statement implies that Jews were involved in the towers failing, whereas the latter implies that there were just Israelis in the area. And those are two very different statements. Even a decade later though, it's become conventional wisdom as the New York Times puts it for Jewish people to just stay home on 9-11 because of so many anti-Semitic conspiracy theorists, which I'm sure as you can guess, they're not asking them out on dates or offering up picnics and stuff like that. So it's not really a pleasant scenario. Now because I just love you guys so much. And I'm apparently masochistic. I watched one of Alex Jones's movies about 9-11. Because if I'm going to criticize someone like him, it's important to know what he's saying exactly, right? 
Alex Jones was one of the executive producers on this series of films called Loose Change, all about the 9-11 terrorist attacks. The 9-11 conspiracy has an extremely complicated history and there's simply too many theories for me to cover all. Still, I wanted to give you a general overview of what Loose Change was about and a few of the claims he's continually made. About 12 minutes in, they say, quote, September 2000, the project for the new American century, a neoconservative think tank. Those members include Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Paul Wolfowitz, and Jeb Bush. Releases their report entitled Rebuilding America's Defenses. The report calls for a massive overhaul of the United States military and encourages fighting and winning multiple theater wars. They declare that the process of transformation, even if it brings revolutionary change, is likely to be a long one, absent some catastrophic and catalyzing event, like a new Pearl Harbor, end quote. In other words, because this think tank recognized that the United States had no massive catastrophic event to act on, no theater wars to win, this means they started 9-11, I guess. Well, here's the thing. Uh, I ended up finding a New York Times article that directed me to a website written by a man named Mark Roberts, who went through the enormous task of explaining, picking apart, and debunking the hundreds and hundreds of claims made in the film. When it comes to this supposed catastrophic event, here's what he had to say. I have yet to come across a 9-11 conspiracy theorist who did not use this quote as evidence that the terrorist attacks were an inside job by the neocons in the US government. However, the PNAC quote is about the typically slow growth of military technology abetted by budget cuts in defense R&D. It is in no way a plan or suggestion for a new Pearl Harbor. Is it plausible that these conspirators would publicly announce a plan to kill thousands of Americans? According to CT Logic, these conspirators are the smartest, most devious, most capable connivers the world has ever seen, but are incredibly stupid. This PNAC quote issue is a lot like the ct emphasis on Larry Silverstein's pullet quote. Alex Jones's documentary continues, and there are so many errors and claims with so little evidence behind them. I'm reminded of that Mike Lindell movie, or his little symposium thing that he kind of did. That was, that was pretty bad too. Dylan Avery, the director of Loose Change, has even admitted that he's not sure he should have released this film, and even he definitely doesn't use InfoWars as a source. This documentary also contains stories about Osama bin Laden that are, of course, unconfirmed. One interviewee, a freelance photographer, said that they didn't see any windows on the planes, therefore it couldn't have been a commercial plane. Yet he was over two miles away from the plane when he saw it, too far away to have actually seen the windows. Hunter Thompson, an author and conspiracy featured in the documentary claims to know enough people who do these things, but doesn't name any names, discuss them in his books, or reveal their motives for committing a terrorist attack. Rumsfeld, the Secretary of Defense, also calls the plane a missile at one point. All flying weapons could be called missiles, but Loose Change seems to consider this to be an aha moment, as if it means the US actually shot a missile at the towers. I won't go on too much longer about Loose Change, I'm sure, I think at least that you get the point here. I'm not at all surprised that Alex Jones worked on this film and perpetuated this misinformation to absolutely dangerous levels. Within this echo chamber community, Alex Jones was a leader, a truther, and worryingly, a news source. The 9-11 conspiracy seems to be what really launched Infowars when it was just starting out. So it seems like a cornerstone of Jones's career. But as we know, it gets worse. Let's get into one of the most notorious conspiracies he's responsible for spreading and how that turned out for him his claims about the Sandy Hook shooting. Now, this is probably one of the most grotesque conspiracies I've ever heard, that the child victims in a school shooting were actors and the entire tragedy was a performance staged by gun control advocates backed by the government. Sure, Alex Jones has the right to free speech, but his victims also have the right to hold him accountable for the impact his words have had and the trauma he's inflicted on them. The events at Sandy Hook are extremely heartbreaking. So for those of you that may not be aware of what happened, I'm going to give you just a brief recap. In December, 2012, a 20-year-old killed his mother, took three guns, and went to the Sandy Hook Elementary School disguised as a law enforcement official. I'm not going to name the shooter because that's the attention he wants, so fuck him. The doors were locked when he arrived, so he used an assault weapon to shoot an entrance into the building and then began shooting, taking the lives of 20 first grade students and six adults before killing himself. Just days later, the conspiracy that the Sandy Hook shooting had never happened began to spread, and that was thanks to Alex Jones. And before we get into what Alex Jones said exactly in those first few days following the aftermath of the shooting, I once again just want to insert my opinion here. 
because much like what happened at the events of September 11th, I very much remember where I was when September 11th happened and what happened that day. And on the day of the Sandy Hook shooting, I also remember what happened that day. I distinctly remember being so disturbed, I thought it was some weird thriller movie my mom may have been watching when I came home from college. I thought it was anything but reality. And I remember realizing and starting to sink in what was happening that day that I just sat down, sank into the couch and I just cried because I couldn't believe in 2012 what our world was coming to. It was so disturbing and devastating to hear that 20 first grade kiddos, like I remember being a first grader, like to be that age and know that your life no longer goes forward at that point because someone killed you out of just anger and hating their own life. I'm sure many of you also remember what happened that day and the news reports that followed and it was, it was bad. I I know that's, such a simple word, but it was hard to swallow. It was hard to hear those those facts, hear the the people that survived speaking out about what happened. It was it was insanely just surreal, the entire thing. And and I'm not part of that. So I can't imagine what happened to the people who were there that day, who witnessed it and survived. And so this definitely just I'm only really mentioning this because it just evokes a certain type of emotion or something from me because I just have such a direct feeling to what happened that day. So to remember all of those emotions and to sympathize with what those people that survived, what those children went through that did survive went through. And then, and then to hear what we're about to hear about what Alex Jones has to say, it's just, Maybe I wanna stir up some of the emotion that you guys could remember the same kind of feeling that I did before we have to remember that this was four days after 20 children and six adults died. This is what Alex Jones said. According to The Guardian, in just one example, Jones would tell his listeners the whole thing was fake. He continued, it pretty much didn't happen. The subject of such lies, such as the Sandy Hook parent, Lenny Posner, were in some instances forced to move multiple times to dodge threats made by followers of conspiracy theorists. In one instance, a Florida woman was sentenced to jail after sending Posner multiple death threats. As part of a ruling against her, she was barred from accessing the InfoWars website. When Lenny, the father of the youngest victim at Sandy Hook, posted photos of his late son, Noah, Hoaxers would call the comment a fake kid and didn't die and write fucking liar on it. For years now, he's been receiving death threats all because of conspiracy theorists that want to believe Sandy Hook didn't happen. And make no mistake, Alex Jones isn't saying this because he's horrified that it did, but because he and other despicable people like him have politicized this tragedy and they've monetized this tragedy, claiming that this is just another way the left is trying to take their guns away. No matter where you land on the topic of gun rights, Sandy Hook happened. But those who believe Alex Jones, conspiracy theorists to the extreme, have gone so far as to write books up to 400 pages long about why it supposedly didn't and how it was a FEMA drill or a false flag event. They've even accused Lenny Posner of fabricating his paternity and his son's death certificate. How low can you stoop? The father of a murdered child had to request that a court appoint an expert to conduct a post-mortem paternity test. According to Lenny, when he published the medical examiner's report related to Noah's death, it was a tough decision at first, and it wasn't something that I took lightly. He also published his son's photos and school records. This was really honoring Noah and revealing the story of his life and his death, which is the story of Noah. It did nothing to stop the conspiracists who only concocted more theories. Posner found conspiracies about himself that he didn't exist or that he didn't attend Noah's funeral. I reached the point where I realized that they were just responding to the tragedy with hate instead of compassion and they weren't really looking for the truth, he said. Posner founded a nonprofit, the HONR Network, dedicated to stopping the spread of misinformation. But naturally this only made him a bigger threat. He couldn't win. If he tried to tell his side of the story, he was wrong. If he tried to combat it and get the dangerous information removed, he was wrong. Alex Jones was determined to target this grieving father. It turned into what seemed like Alex Jones had some sort of vendetta against me because I was hurting his business. I was crippling his YouTube channel, he said. Jones kept repeating Posner's name, repeating Noah's name and called on his audience to investigate Posner. Posner changed his address several times and tried to hide his identity. People still found him. 
One of these people was that Florida woman who was arrested and imprisoned for five months for making death threats. She, as you would expect, was an avid follower of Alex Jones. Posner and Veronique De La Rosa knows a mother, sued Jones for defamation and won $100,000 a few years ago. In retaliation, Jones tried to sue them for over 100,000 in legal fees. I think The Atlantic puts it best when they write. To reiterate, Alex Jones is seeking money from the parents of a murdered child because of a series of lies that have cruelly compounded the family's suffering since the initial tragedy, lies that Jones himself has spread. You might think that this lie would die out quickly because it's so obviously, well, a ridiculous conspiracy, but it didn't. Politicians like Trump back when he was president elect only legitimized Alex Jones further by appearing on his show. To this day, there are people like attack on Titan looking motherfucker Marjorie Taylor Greene who will literally mock and insult school shooting survivors, calling them child actors. And referring to people like David Hogg, a Parkland shooting survivor as an idiot who only talks when he is scripted and claiming he's trained like a dog. I can't imagine what these survivors and their families have to endure. To go through a traumatic event like this is horrible enough, but to then have these people, these seemingly less than human people, despicable conspiracy theorists accuse them of acting, that's horrific. Thankfully, Jones's conspiracist attitude has been called out. In 2019, Jones said that he came to believe Sandy Hook happened, but the damage had already been done. Recently in October, 2021, he was held legally responsible for his false claims yet again. Thank you. This case will be heading to trial for a jury to determine the amount of money he'll need to pay. Neil Heslin and Scarlett Lewis, whose son Jesse was killed in the Sandy Hook shooting, have filed suit against Jones, joining Leonard and Veronique, as well as several other victims' families. Mike Palasek and James Fetzner, the authors of that 400-page book claiming Sandy Hook was a hoax, were also ordered to pay half a million dollars to Leonard Posner. So there's hoping that Alex Jones will be required to pay enough money to make him think twice before opening his mouth again. Frankly, I'm not sure there's any amount of money in the world that would be enough to make him do that though. Years after the Sandy Hook shooting, another school shooting took place at Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. And of course, Infowars jumped on that too. Once again, they turned someone's life upside down, but this time they actually misidentified the gunman. Infowars claimed to have a photo of the shooter wearing communist garb and showed a man named Marcel Fontaine on their website. Marcel lived in Massachusetts and had never been to Florida. His photograph was up for at least five hours, and as a result, he too became the victim of harassment and threats. Alex Jones truly has a way of bringing out the worst in his viewers. According to the New York Times, in March, 2017, Mr. Jones apologized for spreading the hoax known as Pizzagate, which claimed that top democratic officials operated a satanic child pornography ring in the basement of Comet Ping Pong, a Washington pizza restaurant. His apology came three months after a man motivated by the conspiracy theory filed a rifle inside the restaurant. In May, 2017, Mr. Jones retracted several stories and issued an apology to Chobani Yogurt in order to resolve a lawsuit filed by the company for asserting that its Idaho factory, which employs refugees, was connected to a 2016 sexual assault of a child. The shooting at Stoneman Douglas High, along with the student survivors who have since led impassioned rallies for restrictions on guns, quickly attracted the attention of far-right provocateurs. A month after the shooting, YouTube cracked down on some fringe groups whose conspiracy theory videos had climbed the site's trending list. YouTube issued a warning against Infowars, which had published a video that falsely claimed that a Stoneman Douglas student, David Hogg, was a crisis actor. It's no wonder that Jones had been banned on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, and multiple other platforms that don't condone his message. It's hate speech that glorifies violence. Again, Alex does have the right to free speech, but companies have the right to want nothing to do with him. He can speak his mind and run Infowars.com all he wants, but it's not an exaggeration to call his messages dangerous. Alex Jones has obviously still found ways to make excuses for his behavior even now. Under oath, he claimed he has a form of psychosis that made him believe everything is staged. Is it true? Possibly. If Alex Jones does have a legitimate medical or mental condition for firmly believing that the entire world is against him, it would certainly explain a lot. Yet, as far as I've been able to tell, he's also unwilling to change. There's nothing about him saying, I'm going to shut down Infowars because I realize that my psychosis is making me an inaccurate, unreliable reporter. He has not stepped back, attempted to objectively assess the damage he's causing, apologized, or any sort of help to my knowledge. If he's aware enough to recognize that this has become a problem, and problem being a massive understatement really, then surely he's aware enough to do something about it because he hasn't, and because we obviously don't have access to any of his medical records. So I'm not really gonna speculate on that too much further.
Now, because going over every other problematic conspiracy, it'd be Pizzagate or water turning frogs gate would take years, let's continue to talk about Alex Jones as a person and an employer. To no one's surprise, I'm sure, Alex Jones has been accused of anti-Semitism, racism, and sexual misconduct. A former video editor, Rob Jacobson, who's Jewish, has said that Jones bullied him and called him the resident Jew or Jacobson. It seems Alex really never grew out of those old bullying days that he wants to hide. A former production assistant, Ashley Beckford, a black woman, also claims that Jones grabbed her behind while giving her a hug and said, who wouldn't want to have a black wife? Referring to Jones, Beckford said, I was also subjected to harassment and racial slurs by respondents management and some peer colleagues, as well as subjected to sexual harassment and a hostile, sexually offensive work environment. Beckford also claims she was called a coon by senior management of the staff and said she was actively treated differently than other employees because of her race. Jones has denied the claims and said that nobody accuses me of stuff like that. That's total bullshit when confronted with them. Jacobson, on the other hand, says that Jones would also call him beefcake and sent him gay porn websites alleging that Jones was grooming him. Although there really isn't a ton of information on the work environment at InfoWars, a few people have stepped forward and those that have don't have anything good to say. Josh Owens interviewed in this American Life episode we mentioned earlier was also interviewed by the New York Times about his work experience with Alex Jones. According to Josh, he dropped out of film school to edit for Alex because he genuinely believed in him. But as time went on, he saw what it did to people and he regretted it. Anyway, the point is Josh not only talks about the ridiculous conspiracies that he and others at InfoWars promoted, but he also speaks about the time he created ads for an iodine supplement that Jones sold on his website. It was marketed as a shield against nuclear fallout. Right around this time, someone posted a video on YouTube holding a Geiger counter, an instrument used for measuring radiation, displaying a high reading in Half Moon Bay, California. The video went viral and people became paranoid that radiation from Fukushima was drifting across the ocean to California. This was a fear Jones could capitalize on. So for weeks, Josh and members of the InfoWars team traveled to San Diego and Portland, trying to get their own Geiger counter to display a high number. It never worked and Jones was furious. But if he was only angry and not stabbing water coolers with knives because they had grown mold or threatening to ban laughter in the office or throwing away his employees' pet fish, and yes, all three of these things actually happened, then no one would have stayed long. But Jones told his employees that working for him would leave a black mark on their records, making finding future employment nearly impossible. A small price to pay to be a truther or a part of the new world order though. John Doe told us this before in retaliation to OAN. Once you work at a place as infamous as OAN or InfoWars, it's hard to find work anywhere else. Plus, Josh claims that Jones would always sense when someone was going to leave. Once he witnessed Jones give an employee his Rolex off his own wrist because he thought the employee was mad at him. Josh explains. A few times I came close to quitting and like clockwork, just before I pulled the plug, I received a bonus or significant raise. I hadn't discussed my discontent with Jones, but he seemed to sense it. He also tells a horrifying story within this article, one that you could easily argue comes down to recklessness at best and intimidation at worst. It was the summer of 2014 and I rode to the ranch in the back of a coworker's truck, surrounded by semi-automatic rifles, boxes of ammunition and Tannerite, an explosive rifle target. A few of us left early in the morning, arriving before Jones to film B-roll and load magazines. He had no patience for preparation. When he came hours later after eating a few handfuls of jalapeno chips, he picked up an AR-15 and accidentally fired it in my direction. The bullet hit the ground about 10 feet away from me. One employee who was already uncomfortable around firearms lost it, accusing Jones of being careless and flippant. This was one of the few times I saw someone call Jones out and the only time he didn't get angry in response. He claimed he had intentionally fired the gun as a joke, as if this were any better. I stood silently, considering what might've happened if the gun had been pointed a little to the right. Jones also insisted on playing a drinking game with his employees, telling them to hit him and then he'd hit them back in turn, going back and forth until someone relented. Josh claimed he not only witnessed these games, but he even heard Jones had broken a video editor's ribs after insisting he play the game at a bar. Alex Jones has apparently had moments of humanity. Josh says that Jones once told him in secret that he didn't actually like his job anymore. But now with people working under him and Jones having such a massive name for himself, he has to keep doing this and keeping up appearances. I have no idea how true this is, but Alex Jones, if you really hate your job, please feel free to quit. I think it could be one of the most beneficial things you have ever done for yourself and your audience. 
But with all of that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I know we barely even touched the tippy top of the massive iceberg made up of Alex Jones's conspiracies, but today I really wanted to get into some of the more recent litigation and the why of it all. So I hope you learned something new from today's episode. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing so that you can stay up to date on all the newest episodes. I appreciate you spending some of your time here with me today, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.